I'm Brandon Amoroso, and this is the D2Z Podcast, building and growing your business from a Gen Z perspective. Thanks for tuning in to D2Z, a podcast about using the Gen Z mindset to grow your business. I am not Gen Z entrepreneur Brandon Amoroso. I am not the founder and CEO of Retention as a Service Agency, Electric Marketing. This is not my podcast. I am Mark Havener, but we're going to switch it up today. Today, we're going to interview Brandon instead of Brandon doing the interviewing. Brandon is in the hot seat. Thank you for coming on the show. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Brandon. Uh, We've heard about electric. We know that you uh, focus on things like customer lifetime value. We know that you are um, a a rising star in the Shopify ecosystem. But who are you and what do you do? Yeah, so a lot of my, I'd say, day-to-day now is um, sort of split between the regulatory uh, solution that we've developed in partnership with Shopify as a part of uh, the drinks acquisition of Electric, and then uh, the other half being on um, sort of the strategic direction of Electric and making sure that we're staying up to date with uh, all the new tools, trends, technologies within the Shopify ecosystem. Um, and ever since the, the transition into drinks back in April, um, with the sort of the kicking up of the newsletter has been very much so a a driving force behind the direction and path that electric is taking. And so the way we're sort of operating now and the way I look at things is that Sunday newsletter sort of dictates the priorities and focuses for the electric group. And then by me doing that, I've never been more sort of at the forefront of uh, what's here, what's coming trends in the marketplace. And so uh, me actually pulling back a little bit from the day-to-day operations of electric has made electric stronger rather than than weaker, um, which has been been really neat to see. Um, but there's, there's a lot, lot of change. Un- in- there's a lot to unpack there um, because you really have shifted focus to Shopify as your as your core practice for electric. And I'm seeing trends in the papers to borrow a term that enterprise is going more and more into Shopify. And that Shopify is, mo- is, 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 is really become the standard for D2C. This uh, coupled with your journey with drinks, do you want to unpack that a little bit? I mean, why Shopify? What, why, why was drinks so interested in you? What is it that you're, that you're doing? Yeah. I mean, when we, when we first started, we, well, it was just me and just freelancing, doing some SEO and content stuff. Um, just to make some, some cash in college, essentially. And then fast forward, I would say about a a year into it, approaching graduation, um, still, still just myself at the time, but taking on projects here and there, because I was still just trying to learn and have any sort of traditional background in any of this. Uh, you don't really learn anything in school that is practical or gives you hands-on knowledge or any of this stuff. So, uh, Really, it's just like drinking from a fire hose, trying to figure out what I was good at, what I was interested in, what I could sell, because I didn't even know if I wanted to do a marketing agency. I just knew that I wanted to do something entrepreneurial. Uh, the marketing agency was just sort of the easiest thing to spin up because of the low cost of investment that needs to go into it. It's just a services-based business. You're selling your time. So it should be profitable from day one and be profitable always. Um, and so the evolution really came out of that, like me not knowing what I was doing, but also um, growth at all costs, because we were very reliant on the money coming in the door every month to fund the team. And so it was like this cycle of get new clients, go hire more people, get new clients, go hire more people. And it didn't, I didn't really care whether the clients were like B2B or if they were a good fit, if they were not a good fit, it was just money at the time. And which obviously that is not the case at all now, but you have, you, you can't be in this position right now. I don't think unless you do what we did initially, which um, now if I were to like, let's say go start another agency in five years, it would be completely different, but there's also credibility, there's track record. You're not having to like literally grind your way through free engagements to try and get case studies and reviews and for like just to get your foot in the door. So I think there's, it's easy for a lot of people to say like you need to specialize right away and go all in on something, but 
I don't think that would have worked at all in, in, in our case because coming in as an outsider uh, versus somebody who may have had a previous experience in the e-commerce space or somebody who already had like an exit, uh, I think it's just different. Yeah, I was, and I've been uh, in an agency before and there is the legacy way of doing things. And then there is just doing things because you need to get things done. And, and, and the approaches are very different. I mean, we, you, let me back up because you're talking about the past as if it's a distant memory, but, <laughs> but <laughs> when, I guess this, it really isn't that long ago, which is, which no. is, which is funny. Um, because when, when I was your age, I was working at a call center and going to <laughs> bars too much. So, I mean, I think that we, one of the reasons I wanted to do this was sort of the, you know, this Gen Z mindset. I mean, you're, you, you started right out of the gates. You built something over the course of three, four years. It got acquired. You're catapulting through the industry. And it's just, it's amazing to see as a bystander. And I'm, you know, I'm just producing this podcast. I work with you on communications and other things. And I'm just, I'm just standing in awe at, well, I almost said tenacity, but I think the word is just, you know, drive this, this drive. And so um, we're, we're talking about a three-year journey here. Yeah, it was. I mean, it really was. It was May 2019 to April 2022. So just under three years, but that three years feels like it was 10 years. Um, and I, I'm i really terrible at looking at things in that light um, or even just like reflecting at all other than to reflect for the sake of finding things that could have been done better to improve on moving forward. Uh, but, you know, that's something that we could all get better at, I think. Yeah, it's remarkable. And the journey is, um, I think, most interesting because it, it is coming from a place of um, of, of, of your, your age, your youth, because you, you, you as a generation, I'm just going to talk collectively here, and I'm an old man Gen X here. But uh, as a generation, um, you know, you really haven't known anything other than uncertainty. And the rest of us are trying to figure out what to do because everything's so damn uncertain all the time. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, I take notes on your business management and your approach to business, because I think as a native of uncertainty, um, you're doing things that nobody else would have thought to do in terms of building a business, getting out there, getting the velocity and momentum. Well, I think we, we, we thrive in it. And um, at least I would say a, a fair amount of us do, though some people definitely still prefer like, and not that there's anything wrong with this, but a very like defined uh, nine to five and you, you're you like an expert at maybe one specific thing and that's what you do and it's stable and secure and you have like your track record um, or you could look at professions like becoming a doctor or whatever it may be or a lawyer or investment person. Like there's very clear steps to uh, progression and that works well for some. But I think because of that uncertainty, like I really just hate being bored. And if I'm bored, then you lose my interest immediately. And boredom could basically define most of my educational career and internships all leading up to just, I'm going to go do something myself and I'm going to go find a bunch of other people who are extremely bored doing whatever they're doing in their like companies that just grind them down to very specific like functions and tasks. And, uh, that was what allowed us to to thrive, especially in the beginning when we didn't have a fancy office. We nobody knew who we were. You were basically taking a flyer on uh, me, who very transparently would tell you that I didn't know if I was doing it all. Um, but I think that's what <laughs> sort of that's what sort of made it what it was and made it exciting for people to to come in on and, and join. No, yeah. people like that authenticity. I mean, that's that's one thing we need more of, and it's one thing that's refreshing about your approach to business. Is if you don't know how to do it, you don't say you know how to do it. Which, yeah, I think a lot of people take themselves too seriously, um, and also right. the, 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 we'd have some of the funniest stories of like new team members that would join Electric, um, and some people are just so uptight, and and I, I think uh, a lot of managers need to. I mean, you're not, you shouldn't be like friends and you don't have to be friends with everybody or like super buddy buddy but like you also don't need to treat it like it's the 1980s like corporate style structure of um manager versus the rest of the team so there's a 
there's definitely no shortage of funny stories that were shared <laughs> around previous bosses <laughs> and uh, what what they did or did not do. Um, I'd like I'm to sure hear there's some, some story out there about me as well, but hopefully, uh, <laughs> we they're they're endearing. <laughs> Yeah, that's a you described the 1980s thing. I mean, that's that's the legacy mindset, and that's the corporate culture that I mean is still in place today. With you know, not only enterprise or small business, so you have sort of, you know, the the leadership team, and then you have middle management, and then everybody else. Middle management is sort of go between, and everybody's just yeah. checking boxes all day. Well, there's that sounds whole, like stability to the older generations. Yeah, and there's this whole philosophy around you need to have this set of. Uh, criteria or qualifications or have done these things to be afforded a seat in the room. Um, and I think in very like specific instances, sure, that that probably makes sense. Like when we're meeting as an executive team at, at, at drinks now, not all 150 people are coming, but uh, of the company. But at the same time, um, everybody within the organization at Electric is expected to bring their own unique ideas and insights to the table. And nobody is looked at as anything less because oh they just graduated from college or they have 15 years of experience from x y and z companies um i think it's good to have both as a mix in in your organization but i also don't filter feedback or advice or uh whether or not sh i should be giving somebody's uh, thoughts or opinions merit based off of that um because it just doesn't make sense. There's a lot of great ideas that come from from both sides. And that was the reason why I hated all my previous jobs was, especially the ones where it's like, I knew because they were just so archaic. And it's like, I know, and even they knew you should be doing it better. It was just, this is how we do it. And so just shut up and go in your little box. And I would, and I was like the greatest intern ever. I worked three hours a day there, but spent most of my time, uh, the other five on electric, but they still thought I was the most productive the intern they'd ever had so it's uh that's uh that's so true i mean i think what we're finding with um the workplace revolution right now uh, with um all of the catchphrases around um uh you know uh, what, what, what now i'm forgetting all the catchphrases but you know, I, I think the workforce quiet, is quite quiet quitting, quitting right <laughs> uh, i think the workforce is sort of responding to it's like look you know just let me do my job that now the pandemic was really a catalyst to that is that you know, yeah. now middle management couldn't watch and so everybody just got to do their job and found out we were more productive but yeah. that is uh, that sort of a mindset you've had all along and this is i think out of a out of you, you may not have done this consciously but I think what's happened is that you've cre created a real resilient organization. Like it doesn't really matter what happens in the business world or even in the industry, electric's going to be fine. Yeah. And I think that's because of the, the mindset that we tried to instill uh, in the team from day one. Um, so like, I think a very important thing is that I still meet with every new team member that comes aboard, even though I probably will have no direct contact with them, maybe for the entirety of, of the rest of their time with the lecture, but in that meeting, um, getting to meet them, but also very much so stressing the fact that if there's anything, whether it's in the onboarding process that they're going through or the way that we interact or engage with clients or quite literally anything that electric does that they think should be improved upon or isn't going well, that they need to voice it and that it's expected and actually rewarded that they voice it versus just being somebody who's going to come in check the boxes and, and, and do the bare minimum. Um, and then the second being that, and I wish more, uh, more people would do this. And so still working on how to like in, incite some of this a little bit more, but um, like you can reach me via Slack or email or, or text at, at any time. It's uh, it really is just a completely open door uh, policy. And so there's those that take advantage of it and there's, and there's those that don't, but I think it's important to have those two things in place, but just because you're always iterating and getting better doesn't mean you don't need to have processes. But there's a lot of companies that I've worked at where the processes grind people uh, down and the processes just end up being, this is how we do things and we're never going to iterate on them. So that's why we like to have a, a mix of both. Sure, we have all these process guides in place because that's what you need to be able to scale and have an effective organization, but they can change and they will change. And we'll change them like within a day, which is the other thing. People are, a lot of the tech partners and I'd say clients that we work with are shocked 
at how quickly we'll decide to just rip something up and, and move on. Um, but I think that's important to do as well. Just rip the bandaid off. That's why the quiet quitting thing really pisses me off too, because I think it's a, it's just a fundamental flaw in employers that a, they're breeding a culture where it happens, but then B they're letting it happen. Like it's very obvious. I think when people are quiet quitting and so why are you letting them do that? Have a conversation. Like we're not here to waste time. I think our generation is innately aware of time because of, um, just technology and all the resources that we have at our disposal. So the last thing I'd want to do is waste my time at a company that I don't want to be at. So. Yeah. That's, I mean, you said it. I mean, I think the, um, what, what, what's happening here is that you're, you're giving your team ownership of their own jobs and that's shouldn't be, but that is a unique way to manage a team. I mean, you don't usually as a company trust your people enough to do that. And um, what what ends up happening then is if they is that they have ownership of their job, what they're doing, they have open channels for feedback on changing their job and what they're doing, uh, and mm -hmm. that means then that that they are accountable, and that they are allowed to fail, which are two key things to growing as a, as a professional is to fail and to be accountable. So yeah. uh, that's that's the the model that I'm seeing, and I think that's probably why Electric is so resilient. Yeah, I think it comes down to just at its core treating others the way that you would want to be treated which is super cheesy and cliche and, and whatnot but um i think it That's would a cliche serve, for a reason i guess <laughs> it would serve a lot of i would say uh, business leaders well if they thought about uh where they were 10 15 20 years ago and whether or not they would want to be in the shoes of the people that they're now managing given the way that they handle and do things but just, I think that's important of everything to pull yourself back. Um, even little things like the electric website and messaging as having the hardest time figuring it out, continuing to iterate on it. What were we good at? What were we not? Um, and then I read a book building a, a brand story and it talked about the website in one of the chapters and how uh, you need to look at it as if you've never even heard of your own company and that you're somebody who doesn't really even know um, electric or doesn't really even know e-commerce and i looked at our above the fold homepage screen i'm like what the what the hell does this even mean <laughs> obviously this isn't resonating with people because i can barely just explain it having my all my innate knowledge of the business but to put myself in the shoes of somebody who's just seeing it for the first time and they're trying to make a decision between five or different agencies to partner with it just wasn't there but as soon as i looked at it in that lens that's where our whole like customer experience and uh, retention marketing angle came out of and also our like this is what we do this is all that we do and so now it's gotten to a point where um, any Shopify brand that is trying to improve their customer retention it's like oh you you go talk to electric that's what that's what they do and so we've really very rather quickly I would say because we didn't make that pivot until the end of 2021 but 2022 that was sort of our our calling card and something that we're expanding on even more this year, but even out of random places, like companies I've never even heard of software partners who have seen our content here or there, like, you no, know, we're the retention folks. And so you go and speak with them. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of value in that. Well, that came at a good time too. And I don't know if you just, it's because you have your pulse on the industry industry so much, but the, the, the fact that everybody was focused on an acquisition strategy and marketing, not just marketing, but in communications across the board, uh, yeah. and particularly in DDC. And all of a sudden, acquisition became extremely difficult. And so now retention became the new strategy for those in the know. But even without all of that, it's sort of the idea is like, okay, your job is to keep my customers. Great. I mean, that's, you, that, that's way more valuable than getting new ones. Yeah. I mean, we were definitely a little bit lucky in our, in our timing, but also, um, the structure of our organization was set up well to, to pivot in the way that we did, because it's not like I, we only had an SEO, SEO and content team and now all, or in a web team. And now all of a sudden we're going to go hire uh, an email and SMS team and try to build out this retention arm. We already had the email and SMS team there. I think we were already a Flavio platinum partner at the time. Uh, maybe the, maybe the tier below I can't remember, but uh, the infrastructure was there, but as opposed to being an email and SMS agency, we're now a retention agency 
email and SMS just happens to be the biggest driver of retention. So that's why we have such a large email and SMS team. But you work with us because we are dissecting the entire customer journey from the moment they add the cart all the way through the reordering flow. And so it really bothers me when there's email and SMS agencies that like market themselves as if they're retention. Because if you're not in the tech stack making recommendations, if you're not looking for ways to get useful zero party data that will feed into your personalization and segmentation strategy in Klaviyo, uh, you're really only doing half half the battle. Like you cannot just be in in the Klaviyo account. Um, so I think it was important for us that the way that we pivoted was going off of something that we already had in place in place, but was extending it and making it our focus. And um, and then also it was lucky for me because that was just what I was more interested in. Like I really never really never really liked ads and. Um, you like put it into a black box and you're dealing with this algorithm that's constantly changing and you could already see the writing on the wall with the rising acquisition costs so many brands hopping from agency to agency but a lot of the agencies were still looking at some of the earlier exits in the space like i think mute six is one of the big ones um but that model was like 2010 to 2015 where you could spend millions of dollars on Facebook and then charge your clients a percentage of ad spend. That was what netted some of these ginormous exits for these agencies. So everybody had like all of their focus on that. Whereas on the retention side, sir, we're, we are limited a little bit in terms of how much money we're gonna be able to make off of each client. Because it's not like we're taking a percentage of something. When you take a percentage of something, you're always inherently gonna have more upside. But this was just the opportunity. I found it much more fascinating to dig into all the data and analytics around these different customer segments and how you can split them out and create these personalized journeys for them. So I think the timing, the structure of our team, and then uh, just getting a little bit lucky was, was helpful. And then the iOS updates happened and then it was just like everybody was just flooding in. Yeah, the and, and the Shopify ecosystem. I mean, it makes sense why you would pivot and focus on just that because everything's so integrated. You can do far more with Shopify than you can with any other platform. And Shopify, as a result, yeah, I mean, they're huge now, and they're they're only getting bigger. And enterprise is moving in, and you know, we're going to have. I mean, they're they're the next Amazon, don't you think? I think they are really the. They're like the antis antip. I can never say that word, but they're anti. Yeah, they're anti, anti Amazon. <laughs> um, but it's going to be interesting to see how they evolve over the next like two years because they need to help solve the customer acquisition problem that their customers are having. And Amazon doesn't have that customer acquisition problem because it's their own platform. So their ads network, ads network is just internalized. They don't have to deal with any of these iOS update policy changes um, impacting them. But Shopify has such a ginormous amount of store and customer data that they could be leveraging in uh, creative ways that allow brands to access and reach customers easily, but without creating something like an Amazon where Shopify owns the customers and the brands don't, and you're not getting that branded experience. I think there's a happy medium. And you see that with things like Shop Pay, where over Black Friday, I go into the shop pay app. I can see my orders from three different stores all at once, but there's still a branded experience for each store. And I'm a customer of those individual stores. I'm not a customer of Shopify. Whereas with Amazon, that's not how it works at all. So I think the two are going to be the ones that sort of play out over the next five to 10 years here. But the reason we went all in on Shopify is because like we tried all the other platforms and these weren't great for what we wanted to do or the types of businesses that we were trying to reach. And sure, um, I actually wanted to partner with Big Commerce as well, but uh, I think we had like four or five developers at the time. And uh, Taylor was like, "Like we can't. Like no. <laughs> like what are you doing? <laughs> Let's just do Shopify." I'm like, "Shit. Oh, like but you know, there's like one or two clients we could maybe really get on on Big Commerce." So. Um, so you, but was, you listened uh, to your your team and yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. I, I listened and, and and thank God I did. Because that's a that's a whole selling point too on our messaging. Like, yeah. the first time I get on a call of any new prospect, it's uh we only do Shopify. We literally live, live and breathe Shopify. 
you sure you could technically work with us if you're in on Clavio, but you're not on Shopify. I'd say you get about like 70 to 80 percent of electric firepower in in that case. Um, but the true value in us is we know Shopify, we know the entire ecosystem, we know how it connects into Clavio to build out these really robust customer profiles that can then feed into a retention strategy that that actually works. So when people talk to us and we have such clear messaging and, and we know who we are and what we do, it either clicks for them immediately or it doesn't. Or they're like, oh, we're looking for an ads partner. I'm like, well, here you go. Let me refer you to somebody who does that because that's not that's not what we do. And um, there was even a funny Slack message I got yesterday. Like, hey, like, you know, we could technically start doing ads audits as a part of our like customer experience and retention audit. I'm like, well, then why would we not just start doing ads? And it was like this back and forth for 10 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, like we're just, we're not doing this. <laughs> um, which the team even came to the conclusion themselves. Like you're opening yeah. up a can of worms that we we don't want to, and we've already been down that path. Yeah, it's, uh, I think the, um, there are a lot of lessons here, but I think the idea that, you know, what is the Gen Z mindset? This podcast is, you know, growth with the Gen Z mindset and what is that and how can you define that? And I don't think anybody's trying to pretend that you're representing the entire generation, but I think that you're coming from a place it's common within a generation where, where, where this, it, 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 you know, uh, I think I would call it resiliency, although I don't, I don't know when I want to speak for you, I don't know that you look at it like that. I think it's more about um, opportunity and flexibility. And this, this, this ability to kind of create something from nothing and then catapult it over such a short period of time. Uh, it's it's amazing to watch. And I, I think that's what we mean by the Gen Z mindset. It's just not being stuck in a framework. You know, even if it's a new framework, it, it doesn't seem like you're stuck in one. It's it's sort of like, you know, this build frameworks for the changing tides. Yeah, it's definitely the way that I look at it and, and try to approach things. Um, I think, yeah, I think mindset, we all need to take notes. <laughs> the mindset of continual improvement is, uh, I think, is a good one to have. So long as you don't beat yourself up too much, uh, which I definitely can do sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, we all can. So um, now you and I have been working on a book. You, you've you've done all of the thinking, and I'm doing a lot of the assembling. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I I I've been on this journey with you about sort of you say you don't like to reflect, well, you've had to for this book, and you've had to kind of dig deep about some of the um, challenges that you confronted, how you confronted them things you would have done different. Uh, and and I, one of the, the biggest takeaways I'm taking from this book is that uh, this, this Gen Z mindset doesn't need to be exclusive to a particular generation or age. Um, but I also think it's necessary given our, our environment. So how would you define that the Gen Z mindset? I think, well, I think first and foremost, I am, I'm very excited for the book because it was a little bit of a time to reflect, but also I was relearning things that I've learned before that I forgot that I learned that I can now sort of have as a, as a record of, these are the things that you've already tried to do. They didn't work. Why, why not just, uh, as opposed to letting other people learn from them, how about you learn from them yourself as well? <laughs> uh, so that, that, that'll be good. I think the, back to your mindset question, um, I think that it seems like this generation is always looking for something new or better or different. And they're more exposed to the entire world than any other previous generation has been before it. So there's this inherent curiosity and desire to travel and do new things as well. And which I definitely in, embody almost, almost too much, but I think that's, I think that's what it sort of boils down to is this mindset of um, free thinking and continual improvement because we don't want to go work for the same company for the next 30 years. The criteria and what makes a job a good job is no longer the same. Like just because it pays you and the check shows up on time is not the level, like sort of the standard that people at this generation are, are holding companies to because there's so many new startups and so many new opportunities. And if you, it's a lot more rewarding to find something that you really believe in, dig into, 
help grow it and, and then move on. And your time is a finite resource and you don't want to waste it at something that you're, you're bored at or you don't believe in. I think uh, Gen X would have been much better off if we had had that mindset. We, um, we just kind of said, okay, and, and went with it. So I hope that everybody can take, take this to heart. Um, I'm, I, de- I, I think the, uh, well, well, back to the book, the book uh, going to be this next, the quarter is coming pretty quickly. If we can get it out, <laughs> then I think we wanted to get it out much quicker than we did. But um I, I, I'm learning a great deal from this book. And when it, and I think what we can do is talk about some of the more, uh, some of the, each of the chapters and kind of what the, the topics and unpack that over the podcast, that'd be kind of fun to do. But um, I think this is going to be out in just a couple months. So let's yeah, look forward no, to that. Really excited for it. We're going to have a bunch of content from our uh, tech partners, clients, past clients, um, industry experts. It, it, it's it's obviously based off of sort of the three year trajectory of of electric, but it's not one of those because I I hate these books so much. Um, just to look at what we've done, look at the arc of the growth, and we're so great. Uh, it's more so this each chapter is focused around particular lessons and takeaways that uh, I myself are going to be, I myself am going to use when I go into my next venture to start my own business, looking at these chapters and the things that did and did not work because I say 90% of it is applicable across industry and across business type, even though it stemmed out of an agency, uh, which is one of the things I'm grateful for of having uh, an agency business as my first endeavor is because of the number of people that are involved in it. So the sort of like a fast track on people management and just the way people work is it's like probably the most difficult component to, to any business is balancing different uh, team members, personalities, understanding everybody has their own unique goals, set of circumstances, environment, ways they prefer to do things. Yeah. And so from somebody who is not inherently like extraordinarily empathetic, that was like quite the fast track. Um, <laughs> Because I was like, I thought everybody wanted to be this and they wanted to work this way and they wanted to do what I want to do. Um, and, and Zach actually made a comment to me like, no, that is not true at all. Uh, frankly, actually, most people would not want to be doing what you're doing. Like, <laughs> you're, you're crazy. So looking at it in that perspective was really, uh, really valuable. Um, and allowed me to then like sit down with team members and be like, listen, like, what are your goals personally and professionally and how can electric and us help you get there? Uh, and realizing that not everybody's goals are going to be the same as what mine are. Yeah. One of the th- first things I learned from you as we were working on your approach and your messaging back ancient years, I guess a year ago, um, was that, that you, you really do demonstrate this so that, that the belief that a thriving team creates a thriving business that that they're not that you really need to have both and so you spend just observing you spend just as much time with your team uh, making sure that they're supported and they have what they need as you do and you know managing new clients getting in new clients i mean that seems to be a really big factor to your formula yeah i mean if you take care of the team they should take care of everything else and the growth of the business the way the business does things I think it was uh, early 2022 and the 2021 when I asked all 40 team members at the time to submit three things that we should be doing that we're not doing. So we got like 120 suggestions. I went through all of them, built out this like massive slide deck going through each one sort of line by line uh, and walked through here are the ways that we're addressing these things. Here are the ways that we're maybe addressing them in, in a different way. Uh, and also gave people some visibility too. It's like, we're in the process of switching over to a new PEO provider. Um, you wouldn't have any idea that we were though, because obviously why are we like, you know, give do a company wide announcement about that. So it gave some nice transparency there as well, but it was super valuable for me on where we should be taking electric, what's working, what's not working. And then the team really appreciated that follow on meeting where we sat down for like an hour, hour and a half. And I walked through each one, we discussed them. We talked about why there's some that we couldn't do at this moment. Like, I think one of the suggestions was like pay off our college debt. Like, That'd be, be nice. Sure, it would be nice. <laughs> um, 
but also no. And so we all had a nice little laugh about that. Um, but it also, it, like, you're not doing these things to sort of trick people into buying into the company, but stuff like that had so much more, uh, gave so much more ownership to the team because they truly were building and setting the foundation for what we were going to do in 2022. It wasn't just like some, oh, here, go submit a form. And we're going to go file that away in our I don't give a shit pile. Right. It was here, submit it. We're going to sit down. We're all going to walk through it. And then we're going to actually deploy it and give real timelines and have accountability against these things. Um, nobody likes anybody who doesn't have accountability for what they say. So, Yeah, they were listened to. Important. Yeah, they were listened to. And then, and, and then what they said actually had an impact on the organization. Yeah, I think that's why... Robots are going to be interesting because half of companies, that's really what they want. They want robots. They don't want people. And they're trying to turn people into, into robots by grinding them down with processes and like, just go do this. Uh, where, where you're, you're not here for your uh, creativity or anything like that. So um, I would never hire somebody though and like only want them to just do a predefined set of tasks and don't do anything else. I think that's undervaluing uh, the individual and, and what they can bring to the table for you and, and your business. Yeah, and it creates turnover and the cost of turnover. And I mean, it's a good business decision too. It's not just about yeah. being good to people, which is important, but it's also good for your business to be good to people. Yeah. And yeah. it's really exciting to see new team members, especially after the acquisition, who see what we've done, like still get it. And they're really excited about it. And I sit down with them on that first call after the first week of onboarding and they're like, this organization is like, is really awesome. I've never felt more valued or a part of something in just the first week than I have because of what has been built here. But, Oh, by the way, here's one or two things that I also think that you should be doing. Yeah. Uh, which I think is the coolest thing because sure. They're like, yeah, this is awesome. But because of the fact that you said that you want this, like here are some things that I think you should be doing as well. And I think that that's really neat. Yeah, they felt safe enough to do that. That is neat. That's that's great. It's what you want. Yeah. Well, um, this is what it's like to be a Gen Z business leader. Is there anything else you would like to touch on before we sign off? No, I'm, this was fun. I should do one of these uh, every yeah. every couple every couple months. It's probably I easier think, uh, being in the hot seat, huh? I prefer to be in the hot seat. Um, <laughs> I don't like scripting anything either. Scripting is scripting is boring. Maybe an outline, but yeah, maybe. That, I think I I don't think I've ever seen an outline from you. <laughs> All right, not cool. That I, not that they're not important for some people, but yeah. Um, well, uh, thanks for joining us. Where can folks find you online? Uh, the usual: so electricmarketing.com, brandonemorosa.com. You have. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the the best place. I actually went through over the holidays. I don't know why I did this to myself, but I went through every single unread message in, in my normal LinkedIn inbox and my other LinkedIn inbox. Um, horrifying experience. But now <laughs> if you message me on LinkedIn, I should get it. And I'm trying to stay up to date with it. Uh, yeah. Those, those I, love, are the I love those end mails. I, I, I can't believe some of them even work. They have to, I would guess, because people are doing them, but some of them I don't are know. so so poorly thought out. It's hysterical. So for all of those, what I did is I copied and pasted this blurb of like, hey, uh, I just want a newsletter. Go sign up here. Like if you really want to try and pitch me on whatever you whatever you're doing here. Uh so a little, bit, a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of self promotion as well. <laughs> and that newsletter, by the way, I can't um, overstate how how important it is that you sign up for that newsletter. I think that it is one of the the best ones out in the industry, and the more traction that it gets, the better. So, if you're listening to this podcast, go to brandonamoroso.com, sign up for the newsletter. Um, there's some really great stuff in there every Sunday. Yeah, and if there's any resource requests or things that you're curious about that we don't have published yet, just ask, email in, uh, submit the contact form, whatever. I'm always looking for new things to sort of dig into or, or talk about, um, even if we don't have experience in it. But that's really important for, for me to continue to learn because that's what excites me as new things. 
like this upcoming weekend, I'm going to dive into commerce components and all the things that that is going to impact now, which Shopify rolled out like yesterday. Um, so any any suggestions from, from anyone would be, would be awesome. Great. Well, uh, I think that's it. Let's call it. You have a good afternoon and thanks for letting me host. Thanks for doing this. Thank you.